Yeah, so I think I am a child of Star Trek. Um, I I grew up with the next generation, basically, although I, I have been keenly, keenly watching all of them. And the, that Star Trek universe has sort of remained in my mind as possibly the best structured positive not utopian not in the not in the you know, especially in the more recent things it's not purely utopian but a positive vision of how the humanity could be attention all citizens of the future buckle up and step into our time tunnel of imagination to join us on an extraordinary journey into the days of futures past Join me as we embark on exploring those futures we were promised, but which never arrived, with special guests who will share the predictions of the future that inspired them as children. So let's go to our guide, that excavator of the eventual, that historian of the hereafter, that recorder of retro futures, Theo Priestley. Hello and welcome again to another podcast of Days of Futures Past where I discuss retro futures and the future and everything else in between with uh, special guests. Today I have with me Sammy McAlinen. Sammy, how are you? Good, Theo. How are you? Yeah, I'm uh, good, thanks. Thanks for uh, popping on to the podcast today. Uh, could you give us a, a, a bit about your background, please? Because you've got quite an eclectic background. Yes, so um, there was super quick introduction. I went into computer science straight out of high school, uh, originally from Finland, though spent some time in the US and then Canada and then other places later on. So my background is in computer science. I was a software engineer, then a solutions architect, um, then uh, worked in mobile payments way, way, way before their time in, in the U.S. and Finland, then did my other national duty for Nokia back when their phones were cool. Um, <laughs> then, cut, not to use the term flippantly, but became a climate refugee and migrated to Australia in 2009. Um, blended in a telco background here, so um, worked for Telstra for many years in a half a dozen different roles, ranging from mobile subject matter um, expert to renewable generation distributed renewables things like that um equipment energy efficiency innovation program management and a whole lot of other things then a bit under a decade ago or so um after after helping our incoming ceo to come to grips with technology and technology trends um, our then cto told me that look none of us in the leadership team have time to think about the long-term trends and you know the long-term consequences of what we're doing so i'm going to need you to be the guy who has time to think and then tell us what to do i'm like awesome i can do that so that was the birth of then technology foresight practice and then that grew into a more generic strategic foresight practice and we looked at the future with typically three five ten year future horizon depending on the topic or the technology in question and yeah i took my leave out of out of telstra a year and a half ago and Nowadays, half of my time is spent on more today kind of stuff, essentially helping organizations not to not create a sci-fi dystopia by using generative AI. Um, <laughs> and then the other part is more traditional strategic foresight with a 10 year lens. You work with the, um, is it the Institute of the Future? Yes, yes. So I I'm a yeah. senior research affiliate for the Institute for the Future among other affiliations. How was it um, working in a telco who wanted to sort of understand how to uh, use strategic foresight for, um, you know, for their strategy? I mean, did you find it a, quite a hard, hard sell? Because every time you ask someone what, what does a futurist do, you get a hundred different answers. Yeah, and you have to build like a hundred different threads. So yes, it's it can, <laughs> it is hard on like a top line level but then it's through human connections and individual relationships that then you know there might be a project that lights up somebody's lamp in hr and you know they see the value of thinking about the future workforce future of skills in a more strategic long-term way um then somebody in product lines might might appreciate some you know i guess guardrails or 
guidelines on what might happen in a particular product space and it's just a lot of individual engagements that then builds the network but you're right just plugging and playing strategic foresight into the strategy practice is really difficult at best was it more about research um and, and and trying to extrapolate trends or was there was there some kind of sort of science fiction aspect and science fiction prototyping where you were dreaming up what the future could look like or was it very kind of grounded into you know nuts and bolts and and, and data okay as you would appreciate with any large corporation the closer it is to today and the closer it is to revenue the better it's received so there, right. there just there there was very little that kind of a blue sky sci-fi thinking um having said that there was a lot of um i think risk driven emphasis on things like responsible ai ethical ai and you know to their credit tells to us pretty early and seriously involved in that so they really generally did not want to do their own thing when it comes to ai mm. so in that sense um we did look at some sort of science fiction usually science fiction provides warning signs for us annoyingly and then billionaires go and view those dystopian visions as a roadmap and that's somewhat yeah. frustrating but <laughs> you know how that goes <laughs> yeah yeah it's uh, yeah black mirror was not an instruction manual but uh, how many uh, black mirror episodes have turned into uh um uh at silicon valley reality um well, what's it like in australia because obviously you've you've moved around Peace. an awful lot um and now you're in australia which we can hear in the background which i actually find is great in terms of just having a you know a natural atmosphere to a podcast but um you know what's the what's the innovation sort of landscape in australia like just now it's really interesting so there's a lot of i want to say groundswell innovation and innovation is highly regarded and um, what has traditionally been one of the Achilles heels of Australia is the startup um, venture capital market, particularly past the seed round, but before, you know, profitability, you know, it's slowly getting better, but there are still a lot of Australian startups that then just go to Silicon Valley to, mm. you know, play in the bigger funding pools. Um, Australia as a country and a culture is compared to the US is definitely more risk averse, which kind of puts a bit of a damper, particularly onto the VC, VC market side. Mm. It sounds a bit like the UK actually, where I think we, we, we like to make a lot of press announcements about how innovative and how much money we pump into the ecosystem. But the, the reality is when you, when you come to speak to VCs and angel investors, is that like you say, it's, it's very risk averse. Um, yeah. And especially in Scotland, what you tend to find is uh, startups um, spin up quite rapidly and then find that the money runs dry after pre-seed and seed round and then move elsewhere, which is a bit of a shame because it's a bit of a brain drain. But, um, you know, the, I remember speaking to um, a, a, a doctor who's in the space industry and I think he was trying to push really hard um, the Australian Space Agency um, to build... Right space um ports in australia mm. because you obviously have a massive land expanse um which can be used and and uh, and be far away from populated areas um but i think the the appetite to put that much capital into into projects of that size just scares everybody absolutely yeah and there will be plenty of potential for these kind of nation building projects whether it's space whether it's things like nuclear power or even renewables but obviously there are a lot of vested interests sort of dampening some of those enthusiastic visions. Um, and uh, yeah, nation building as a activity globally, you know, it seems like we don't do enough of that. All of okay. the truly spectacular nation building projects nowadays tend to come from China because they, they build infrastructure, tr tremendous amounts of ins infrastructure. Mm. Um, whereas, whereas the Western countries have kind of seemed to devolve into an election cycle, blinkered visions with these things. Yeah, uh, one of our, our former guests, um, 
said much the same thing in terms of being stuck into that um you know that quarterly or election cycle every four years that's as far as uh, someone's thought process or vision goes because they know that if they don't make the next election then there's no point thinking about it um there's no point putting something in place because they're not going to see it happen um so tell me about when you know because you've obviously had a, that, that background in computer science and then into futurology uh, and in future studies and being a research associate with the Institute of the Future. At some point during your childhood, you must have been inspired by something, you know, uh, from, you know, those future visions that made you think, well, you know, this is what I want to kind of do and this is how I want to uh, mould my thought process in a way. Yeah, so I think I am a child of Star Trek. Um, I I grew up with the next generation basically although i i have been keenly keenly watching all of them and the, that star trek universe has sort of remained in my mind as possibly the best structured positive not utopian not in the not in the you know especially in the more recent things it's not purely utopian but a positive vision of how the humanity could be and that that's kind of that I think rekindled my sort of long-standing interest in foresight as well to try to build something positive. Mm -hmm. There is another sort of more embarrassing element. I, I did also watch Knight Rider and I, I felt like, you know, it'd be great to have like a self-driving car like it with some personality. Not quite there yet, but you know. <laughs> I don't know. Actually, I don't know if you, uh, uh, we're going to date this episode actually by speaking about CES. But this week, CES um, uh, Volkswagen has announced that they're integrating ChatGPT into their cars, so you can actually speak to your car a, a bit like Kit um, and uh, and in Knight Rider. So that that kind of future is uh, is, is is encroaching. Yes, I'm sure we'll get to, you know, self-driving cars eventually, but I think it's, um, it won't be next year. So what was it specifically about Star Trek? Because, I mean, obviously Star Trek from the 1960s all the way through to the next generation and the movies as well, and then you've got yeah. the other spin-offs like Deep Space Nine and uh, Voyager. They all had their specific techno technological advances. and yeah. You know, Star Trek in the 60s had computers that you could talk to. Um, and and tricorders and mo the mobile phone, which was the communicator in a sense, and you know Motorola StarTac took a bit of a, a flip. You know the flip phones uh, took a bit of a lean towards that. Was it more about the technology that inspired you, or was it about the utopian kind of vision of society coming together in, in a completely different way? I think it was a mix of both. I know as a young kid, probably more you know the technology side, but then as I, as I grew up and started thinking about you know society in a more complex manner, then you know that societal aspect of the um, I don't want to call it utopia because it's not quite utopia, mm -hmm. but the the kind of alternative ways of structuring society became more important there. Although I, I do remember, um, on one hand the next generation had these pads which look very much like ipads today mm. and that, that kind of felt like visionary when ipads came out uh and but in in the next generation there seemed to be like 10 pads on the table at any given point in time they were like different things and different pads and i'm like well you know they didn't get that right because you know one ipad is enough for you know mm. all of those use cases but then when I look around my table now and there's like, you know, the kids have two iPads each and I may have three and it's like, <laughs> so we, yeah. <laughs> maybe they got that right after all. But, but there, is, if there, there is like, you know, the, the societal elements and I would, I would like to think that we get to a post, post scarcity econ economy. Um, I'm, I don't agree with Jeremy Rifkin's very optimistic visions on how we get there. And, you know, I think we are coming up to some pretty fundamental material boundaries on on the mm. planet. So, you know, complete post-scarcity economy and probably not anywhere near in sight quite yet. Um but there are certainly lessons to be learned from from the societal structures point of view as well. And I, I, I love the 
sort of ethos that we no longer live to work, but to better yeah. humanity. Yeah, that was a core message that uh, I think it was that Picard actually said um, in uh, one of the first movies, actually, First Contact. Uh, but how, how... So moving towards that kind of sort of... We won't call it a utopian, but optimistic society. And I think you use the word optimist um, in, your, in your bio as well. You know, how do we carry that optimism, which was very prevalent in the sort of 40s and 50s, coming out of, you know, the world wars and, and uh, economic depression and then moving towards the atomic age in space? It was a very optimistic time. And then we seem to have gone from optimism all the way back to sort of cynicism and, uh, in a sense, dampened realism. You know, how do we almost capture, recapture that lightning in a bottle? For, for, for an optimistic view of society um, and ingrain that even in, in, in the business, um, you know, a strategic point of view of foresight rather than being, I guess, um, overly concerned with KPIs and that, and that kind of short-term view. Uh, yeah, I mean, that is the trillion dollar question while we still have dollars isn't it um <laughs> i mean time and time again human history has shown that societies don't really pay serious attention to stuff before there is a crisis unfortunately really? and you know we are we are walking into a plethora of crises as we speak on a number of fronts many of which operate on time frames that humans are just not good at handling but and, and you know looking at where everything is headed um Part of me is despondent because, you know, well, this is not the way it's supposed to go. But then part of me, um, remind, I remind myself that even in the Star Trek universe, it took, in, in that fictional universe, it took World War Three and First Contact for humanity to get its shit together. So, you know, maybe there are a couple of bumps in the road. Maybe hopefully we won't have to go through World War Three um relying on there being first contact before humanity gets and uh, its focus is is a bit of a risky strategy so hopefully we can be <laughs> a little bit better than that um when you mentioned that i describe myself as an optimist um you left out an important disclaimer i describe myself as a post-mortem optimist so i i, I <laughs> which means that i believe things will get better but not before i'm dead <laughs> So we have to wait for you to <laughs> well, for you to pass on before. Yeah, we are, I'm hoping it's not a causal relationship like that. Yeah. <laughs> Is there anything that you've you know when you were growing up in your childhood, um, and and you, you were reading science fiction and, and and watching Star Trek and things like that, and you thought, I really want to see this in the future. You know, aside from the ge the, the generic side of things um, of Star Trek and whatnot, was there anything else that you thought this would be great when I grow up and I'm an adult and I want to see this that hasn't come true yet? Oh, there's probably heaps. I mean, um, faster than light travel would love that. That would be amazing. You know, I, I would love nothing more than go explore the universe. Um, <laughs> Obviously, transporters would be great. Um, a lot of technology that would be amazing. Um, replicators, I mean, 3D printers could be seen as like a very, very 0 0.001 version of a replicator. Not really. I mean, I like cooking and I like food. <laughs> so I'm not, not really looking forward to having my dinners replicated. Um, but yeah, there's, there's obviously a lot of stuff that hasn't come true and there's stuff that i tried to make come true earlier and the technology wasn't ready so i always love love the concept of having like an it sounds creepy now because surveillance is seen as a very bad mm. thing which it is the way it's being done but i love the concept of having like an omnipresent computer that you could just say computer do this for me um and when i went to uni in like mid 90s i tried to build one with the open source tools available then and the microphone technology available then and you know speech recognition just was not there mm -hmm. i rigged up a system the best i could find um didn't really have a budget but you know i had a microphone which worked well enough and then a pc running linux and 
I forget what the name of the open source uh, speech recognition software was, but I gave up at the point when I used to test phrase, just saying like testing speech recognition, and the output of the system was, and the whole world had nothing to eat. I'm like, oh, well, screw that. That is like <laughs> new <right> here. <laughs> <laughs> but now now at least we've solved the speech recognition part like whisper is amazing and i use that regularly mm. <laughs> but 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 does the but does the current system still think that we're gonna go have nothing to eat <laughs> maybe it'll well, give us a time frame this time <laughs> yeah yeah hopefully <laughs> <laughs> um sammy where can people find out more about what you do because obviously you know you have your own practice um i believe um yep. and you also have your research as um associate or affiliates with um institute of the future so so the best place to look me up is just linkedin just search and follow or connect there always happy to connect with people i i post i used to be on twitter or x um, but then that became such a shit show uh, that a uh, garbage fire that I'm not, not really there anymore. Um, and I moved my book reviews to LinkedIn as well. So every Monday I leave a review of a book I've read recently. So that that's proven to be a good platform for that. And yeah, my my business is transitionlevel.ero, A-E-R-O. Um, so you can find me there as well, but LinkedIn is best. Okay. What kind of book reviews do you do? I have a somewhat, let's call it eclectic taste in books. <laughs> so it, it's you can you can see in the background there are quite a few books here. <clears throat> um, um, I read a lot of I read some business books, so some some what you'd call normal, quite a bit psychology, quite a bit science. Um, quite a bit about metacognitive stuff so thinking about mm. thinking and um yeah new technologies i don't want to call them like self-help books but they right. certainly have helped me view the world differently and every now and then there is a book that really nudges my worldview to one extent so um the most my first my first book review of this year was of um lurman's how god becomes real uh, so she's an anthropologist and she takes the lens of anthropology um to god and other spirit creatures without taking without taking a stand whether those are objectively real or not but she explores the process of how people make them real to them and mm. what that entails and how much work that is and you know how that changes people uh, for good or bad for that matter and that was just that was a fascinating sort of viewpoint into that because so often even anthropological work when it deals with religion comes from this mindset of well, of course, none of that is real, so they're kind of dumb in believing that, but here's how it goes. And she kind of sidesteps all that kind of value judgment and talks about it in a very refreshingly, refreshingly different perspective. Uh, is there one book in particular that you would recommend to, to listeners and viewers to kick them off on a different... Um, a different thinking path, shall we say. There are so many books that have um, sort of nudged my worldview, but I think one that I read a couple of years ago that really left an impression was Lisa Feldman Barrett's How, Emotion, How Emotions Are Made. So I'd maybe leave right. that as a recommendation. Any particular reason why? Was there something that stood out? That you can remember it's, yeah i i it's hard to crystallize it i i think it just made me think about some of the what we what we view as fundamental functions of the brain in a different mm -hmm. light and how we can sort of step outside some of those processes and influence them 
ourselves as well. Okay. Um, well, Sammy, thanks for your time today on the podcast. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, I will leave the um, your links to your uh, website and to LinkedIn um, in the show notes. Um, thanks for listening again. Uh, please join us for another episode of Days of Futures Past, where we will discuss uh, rich future futurology and um, everything in between uh, with our next guest. This is Days of Futures Past, signing off, when we'll once again peel back the curtain on more lost futures. Stay tuned, and remember, the future may be here, but the past never fades. Until next time. Days of Futures Past was brought to you by Theo Priestley, keynote speaker, author, and retrofuturist. If you'd like to appear as a guest and reminisce about futures gone by, get in touch. I've been your radio host, Andrew Helbig. Goodbye for now.